Thanks, Ken, and, and I uh, just want to uh, thank you for uh, both uh, warm welcome reception. Uh, Ken asked me to come here uh, literally about a year ago, and uh, due to schedule conflicts and a number of other things, it's been um, hard uh, finding the time to, uh, to put all this together, but I'm really glad this has finally happened, and I'm glad to hear, be here with all of you. Um, I get a chance to talk about renewable energy now. Gosh, I feel like I'm on the lecture circuit almost every week. Um, and I start almost every talk with, uh, it's a great time to be in the renewable energy business. It, it hasn't always been that way. I've been uh, in this um, particular topical area pretty much my entire professional career. That's uh, well over 30 years these days. Uh, I, I left Bell Labs when I was um, a young, young engineer to start the solar programs down at Sandia National Laboratories in Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, before uh, SERI and now NREL ever existed, before DOE existed. It was back in the, in the ERDA uh, era. And uh, so it's really quite refreshing to see uh, how much uh, things have changed, how, in fact, um, all that work that's been going on for literally three decades is finally coming to fruition. Um, and I'll start with kind of the good news story, because I think uh, the other part that I would like for you to take away uh, this evening is that um, the challenge that we have in front of us in terms of, um, in terms of our energy um, uh, challenges for the country and for that matter for the world are, uh, are horrendous. They're, they're, they're daunting, they're uh, incredibly acute and I don't think uh, the national dialogue really um, fully appreciates that. Uh, I think it's refreshing that we're having a national dialogue. I, I, I'm, I'm pleased that uh, uh, both campaigns in the presidential election are are um, uh, talking about renewable energy in, in particular, but clean energy and, and a new energy economy of the future. Um, so I'm going to kind of run the, through my uh, slides very, very quickly, um, uh, hopefully to get uh, uh, some, some uh, uh, stimulation, of maybe some questions that, that, that are really on your mind. I'm anxious to hear kind of how you um, view this topic. Uh, and, and I get a lot from your questions whenever I get a chance to talk to you about these things. So I'm going to go rather quickly. I'm going to say some things that many of you already know and for hopefully uh, you'll, some new things that will come uh, be insights that will be of value to you as well. Uh, our challenges are enormous. I said that earlier. Uh, is it about security? Is it about economic productivity? Or is it about environment? Well, the fact is it's about all three and we need to do those um, quite uh, aggressively. Uh, there's mounting evidence. We all uh, understand uh, how um, our, our, our climate is changing in, in many respects. Uh, I think the uh, uh, international panel on, uh, on uh, climate change would, would suggest that that is human-induced. And there's lots of issues that relate to um, the effect uh, that global warming is having. Probably the thing that, that gets to most uh, Americans is the price of, uh, of gasoline. When you go to the pump and you all of a sudden see the price going through the roof, uh, it really becomes to, it starts to hit home. And this is really where the dialogue has begun. Uh, in recent years, it's really about technology, um, or I'm sorry, rather about energy security than it is about anything else. Uh, and so um, let's examine that for a moment, and then I'll come back to what renewable energy is and the, and the, and the value and the role of R&D that goes along with it. This is uh, the Energy Information Administration. It's, a, it's the agency that's been embedded in, within the Department of Energy that gives us projections about where our energy mix is today and where we will be uh, decades from now. Um, it's, uh, this is our mix today. You can see it's primarily fossil fuel, and it will remain that way for some time. Uh, interesting enough, people will, will, will uh, kind of be surprised by the fact that we've got 6% renewables today, and the projections are, even though the amount of energy uh, required for the country is going to increase by 34%, that we only get to 10%. And I can tell you that two years ago, this same projection was that that number would be 7%. So the good news is that it, they're at least acknowledging that renewables will be more than it is, um, uh, you know, more than it will, it will be more than, than we thought it would be last year, but uh, I will offer that it's, um, it's still quite a bit less than what I think it will actually be. Uh, now, if you just look at the electricity part and you ask uh, where do we get our power generation from, and this, is, this is the map that, that gives you that, so it's primarily half coal, um, natural gas, nuclear is about 20%. 
Uh, hydropower is about 7%, so all the total renewables is about 9.5%. This non-hydro renewables is 2.4%, and of the 2.4%, most of that, believe it or not, is biomass. People wouldn't expect that, but it's biomass power. Pulp and paper kinds of, kinds of uh, industries that use a lot of it. And, and here's wind. Wind is 27%. I'll talk more about that later. Geothermal is 15%. Solar is one half of 1%, and, and that is of the two point, that one half of 1% of this piece, which is only 2.4%, which is a little bitty minuscule piece, and I just wanted to, to, to reiterate that. Well, so I've been in this business a long time, as I mentioned, and the first question that I always get asked, and I, I got a chance to testify in front of Congress last year five different times, I got the same questions both times. Um, first question was, when is this stuff going to be real? And the second question is, and, and how much can we actually get? So the first question uh, I will answer here in a moment, you know, I, 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 uh, uh, I, I told the, the, the members of Congress, it's real today. It's just not real in the U.S. It's real to the tune of $150 billion a year in terms of an industry, but it's not much in the U.S. Um, and how much can we get is really answered by this particular graphic. This graphic is a projection. Uh, again, EIA is the Energy Information Agency. IEA is the International Energy Agency. This is out of, out of Paris. And then the, the Pew is the Pew Foundation. All of these various uh, groups that project what the, what, the, um, what, the, what the potential can be really uh, have a bunch of assumptions embedded in what they, what they assume. And what was interesting to me is that so we, our, our policymakers look at these graphics and they say, well, gosh, if we're down here on this one, it's only 5% by the year 2040. You know, the kind of the, the, the conclusion one draws is why bother? Um, you know, some of these others are a little bit more. Uh, what, what, are the, what are the assumptions that are behind this? Well, they're over here in the legend. And the legend is that even under the most um, extreme conditions, we think that the price of a barrel of oil may get to $100 a barrel. So, obviously, uh, there's, a, there's a problem with, with the assumptions. And, and it's very clear that, um, that uh, what we don't know is we, we, we really have a hard time uh, projecting where things are going to be. And, and I think what you'll find is that many of these folks, these are, these are done by economists. They're done by uh, econometric models, we call them. And they're a little bit like driving your car and projecting where you're going by looking in the rearview mirror. It's, by, it's, it's, it's what, what has happened in the past, and if you just extrapolate what has happened in the past to the future, that's the projection you're going to get. That's kind of the way the models are, are geared, and that's essentially what you get. But it does not accommodate fully the, 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 the market dislocations that occur when there are disruptions in oil and those kinds of things. It does not um, take into account, uh, obviously, uh, the, you know, the volatility of the price of oil and, and, and uh, innovation, innovation in the R&D community. So that is where I think there is great opportunity. And it really uh, then helps me answer the question that, um, that I get from, uh, from the Congress, which is how much can we aspire to in terms of renewable energy and energy efficiency? And I take that question and I turn it around and I ask it back to the member of Congress and I say, how much would you like? Because it is not a matter of technical potential. It is a matter of investment and commitment to make these outcomes that you want to have happen. Um, the good news is um, I had a chance to host the president uh, a couple of years ago back at the laboratory. And he came and we had a, a nice discussion around a variety of topics. But what was interesting to me was that there was no lack of will for suggesting that there can be a large fraction of our energy mix in the future from renewable energy. And it is a, mat mat a matter of of investment and technical will. So in the, in the national program today, here is what you see in terms of our aspirations. And I'll call these aspirational goals, not because we can't get there, but because it takes a lot of things in order for us to get there. And I'll, and I'll mention that here in a minute. Um, a couple of uh, months ago, we unveiled a thing called the 20% electricity vision. Um, this is a report that we, uh, we uh, uh, co-authored uh, at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory with the Department of Energy. And, and 50 other groups. And essentially, we, we developed the roadmap by which you get to 20% of our electricity from wind technology by the year 2030. Now, this just happens to be the report that if you're watching any of the news programs these days, you'll see T. Boone Pickens up talking about renewable energy and talking about wind. He holds this report up and says, we, and now he wants to do this in 10 years, which I find really aggressive, but, uh, you know, uh, T. Boone has a lot, of, uh, a lot of experience in the marketplace. I mean, I, I, I certainly do value what, uh, how, he, how he approaches things. Um, I will also add that there's a 10% electricity goal by the year 2025. 
uh, but from solar, and there's also a, um, a renewable fuels, in this case it happens to be uh, biofuels and, and, and ethanol in particular, uh, 36 billion gallons by the year 2022. That's all part of the Energy Security Act. Now, what I tell the members of Congress, and I had literally uh, 20 members of Congress come through the laboratory last week, uh, was the following. If we were to achieve each one of these goals, it would cost us, literally, down here, down, down here, two trillion dollars of investment over the course of the next two decades. Now the interesting thing is that if you look at what EIA projects, EIA projects that there will be in fact two trillion dollars investment in infrastructure in this country for energy over the next two decades. Internationally it'll be 22 trillion dollars. It is a lot of money. A lot of money will be spent in our energy infrastructure over the course of the next two decades. The question is what will we spend that money on? Will we spend it on the conventional approach to, th to, our, to our energy mix, or will we do something different than what we've done in the past? And that really is a policy question, and one that I think uh, is, deserves a lot of dialogue and discussion in the marketplace. The, but, the, but the news is here, the government's not going to do this. The private sector is going to do this. And the government can facilitate and help steer the, the, the investments, but that really is what needs to happen. Uh, when we talk about how you get to significance, we talk about speed and scale. We need to move technologies into the marketplace much more quickly than ever before. I mentioned I'd started uh, in this business 30 years ago. 30 years ago, I was in the laboratory. We were doing some very cool science and very cool research. The technologies that were in the laboratory then are the technologies that are commercial today. It took 30 years to get them from the, from the laboratory to the marketplace. And I told the president when he was out, I said, you know, Mr. President, it's our job to make sure it doesn't take 30 years to get the technology that we have today, which, by the way, is phenomenal technology. We have no lack of innovation and creativity in the laboratory. But it, 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 we cannot wait 30 years to get that technology into the marketplace. We've got to compress that. It really is about speed and scale. If you can't move that technology into the marketplace and invest the $2 trillion that we're going to invest in these technologies, then we're going to lock in some technology that we're not quite as comfortable with going forward as we are with some of these newer advanced technologies. So, renewable energy, and this is electricity. This is about replacing fossil fuels in terms of our transportation sector. And this is about efficiency. There are, there are certainly cost and performance issues with some of these technologies, albeit they're not as, 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 uh, as uh, uh, acute as some people believe they are. But more importantly, we have infrastructure problems with these, with these uh, various technologies. It's not really about the fact that the technology can't perform. It's that the technology really is not a good match for the market conditions that we have today. Now, I'll just uh, go through a couple of other things real quickly. What we're seeing today is this is our renewable energy, infra a renewable energy um, nameplate capacity that's being added on an annual basis to the country. And, and uh, what you'll see is that now we're up around 30 gigawatts. Um, and that's, uh, that's a significant amount of energy, believe me. Uh, most of that, the new stuff is wind. Uh, I'll talk uh, a little bit about the wind technology here in, the thing in, a, in a moment. I mentioned that uh, the investor community is making an investment. It's a $150 billion industry today. This is how much is being spent in the, by the venture groups. And this is the growth rate over the last couple of years, year over year annual growth rates. These are phenomenal growth rates, starting from small numbers, but going uh, very, very, uh, very, very fast. This is what's different about this cycle in our, in our energy mix. This is the first time that we've seen this kind of private sector investment. And you talk to the investors, and they'll tell you the reason that they're investing in, in these technologies in the clean tech sector is because they believe there will be public policy. And ironically, they are now influencing public policy because it's their dollars that are now in the marketplace. And so there's a lot of things that are going on. I mentioned a lot of stuff going on in, in, the, in, the, in the laboratory. And, and, and uh, I, I've got to tell you, as a, as a, as a scientist and researcher, um, uh, I am absolutely astounded and impressed by how much creativity there is in the marketplace, uh, in the laboratory right now, and, and moving into the marketplace rel relatively quickly. Um, what's different about today is if we're going to affect the marketplace, we really have to do this 
in managing that lab to market interface and it really has to do with partnerships it has to do with harnessing the innovation that's in, in that's in our universities that's in our research labs that's that's in our uh, public private partnerships and and moving those into the marketplace much more quickly and to take essentially government and 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 uh, and, and um, both federal level and state level regional economic development as the drivers to move the technology much more rapidly uh, going forward now here's my one uh, commercial for the national renewable energy laboratory uh, again, we are a Department of Energy National Lab focused on moving technology into the marketplace that's renewable and that's, that has to do with energy efficiency. And as we look at the context that we are working in, our job is to get technology in the marketplace. So it's not about doing the, the widgets on the supply side or even looking at the end, end use side. It's looking at market solutions that marry both the supply side, the end use side, and then everything in between that connects the, 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 um, the supply to the end use. And it has more to do with distributed technologies moving into the marketplace much more, um, uh, much differently than we've seen in the past. Our energy system today is, 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 was built on the concept of big power plants and big wires. And, and today we have the opportunity with renewable resources that are very distributed. We used to think that was a, that was a liability. It actually is an asset. Is to, is to harness that at the local end use so you don't have to do so much transmission and, and delivery that in fact you can do a lot more with that going forward. Um, I'll, I'll mention efficiency because efficiency is the low hanging fruit. This is the one message that we, that we preach over and over to the Congress and that is there are a lot of things that we can do today that make great business sense to do and we just don't do them. Um, there was a couple of studies. This one's done by Vattenfall. It's a company out of Europe. Uh, but there was a similar study that was a follow-on to this done by the McKinsey folks, um, doing essentially the same thing. They were they were looking at what would the so assuming that you care that you emit carbon into the into the atmosphere, and assuming that you put a price on that emission, what would be the price of carbon necessary in order to make these technologies? Uh, viable in the marketplace. I mean, that would be the, the question you would ask. Well, what you find is that this is zero here. These are, all, these are all negative numbers, meaning that it doesn't take there to be any price on carbon. In fact, carbon can be a negative number, and these still make sense to do in the marketplace. And if you look at them, what they are is their efficiency things, their insulation, their, their, their um, fuel-efficient commercial vehicles, their lighting, their air conditioning, water heating, um, you know, a variety of things. Here's sugarcane biofuels. Uh, there are a number of technologies that make good business sense today. In other words, you can get a return on investment by employing them, and in fact, we just don't do it. And you ask the question, why don't we do that? Let me give you an example. Buildings matter. So first of all, uh, we, here's, our, here's our end use sector. Buildings use about 40% of our energy. Uh, transportation uses about 28%, and industry, industrial processes use 32%, about 100 quads, this is a couple of years ago. Buildings, both residential and commercial, have these, these loads, just for, just for um, just for reference, the things that we that consume energy in our buildings. 72% of the nation's electricity is spent in our buildings. 72% of electricity is spent in our buildings. Really inefficient use of, our, of, of, of electricity in this case. 55% of our natural gas is, is spent in, 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 in buildings. Now, uh, again, these are just some of the goals that we have on, on the buildings thing. I'm going to mention here now this notion about how can we do better on efficiency and why don't we do better on efficiency. Well, the reason we don't do better on efficiency is that building, uh, buildings are built by builders and, and, and uh, the, the construction industry who make decisions to build the building based on lowest first cost. They don't really, really... Uh, take into account what the, what the energy consumption of that building will be for the future. The tenant is stuck with the, build, with, with the, with the uh, utility bills for that building for the, for the life of the building. So if you were to, if you were to look, in, and I par pardon me for, for showing a graphic here <laughs> in a public meeting, but what, what, you, what you have here on this, on this axis is the cost of a mortgage and the cost of your utility bills. And if, if, if you just built a building to code, and say this particular house, this is a 200, this is a 2,000 square foot, uh, you know, two-story home uh, with certain conditions to it. Um, the, the price of your mortgage and utilities on dollars per year over the life of that building is, is shown right here. 
what it shows is that if you were to put in efficiency measures in that building, and, and, and in this case, it's less than 10% of the initial price of the home, to put in efficiency measures, you could actually, over the, over the life cycle cost of that home, show that you can save up to 50% of the energy that that home will actually consume over its lifetime and still make it cost effective to the tenant uh, over, over the lifetime of the building. In other words, you could put the energy efficiency measures in that home and save a significant amount of money as well as 50% of the, 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 uh, the energy that that building will use over its lifetime by just making those efficiency, efficiency um, uh, investments early on. And we don't do that because the builders build the lowest cost and the tenants are stuck with the bills, they're stuck with the utility bills. Now, the solution to this is very simple. Uh, there's, we, we like to say if there's a hard way and an easy way. The easy way would be to change the building codes. If you were to just change the building codes to require that the building actually be green or greener uh, when, when you build it, then you're in a position where you can actually maximize or optimize the value of that home. We don't do that because there's lots of jurisdictions and a variety of, of, of complications in getting to energy efficient buildings. Uh, what's interesting to me is that um, we're building a building at, at, at our laboratory right now that uh, our, our criteria for that building is that it will, it will uh, consume no more than 25,000 BTU per, per square foot. Now that's a, that's a, that's a figure of merit. Um, all of the national laboratories in the Department of Energy on average on average, have 250,000 BTU per square foot footprints. We can build a building at 10% the energy <laughs> consumption today of what our average, our average stock is in the, in, the, in, the entire, in the entire national laboratory system. That is amazing to me. And this building we will build, by the way, is a, is a, is a 220,000 square foot building. It'll hold 800 people. And, and when we're done with it, and we're going to put photovoltaics on the roof, it will actually generate as much energy in the course of a year as it consumes. It'll be a net zero energy building. It can be done. It's not a question of can it be done. It can be done. It makes good sense. We don't do it because we have structural issues. Those are what I call market failures. Those are the things in the marketplace that need to be fixed if we're ever going to get to the outcome that we want. I'll just say a word about, about vehicles because vehicles really is the other big consumer of, um, of energy that we can fix. There's no reason we should not have um, much more efficient fleets than we have today other than over the course of time we as consumers have valued things like bigger cars, higher performance, safety, a variety of other things that consumed our energy uh, on these vehicles more so than, we, than the value that we put on, on saving um, uh, fossil fuels. So that's changing, that's changing, and we need to, we need to make that stuff happen more quickly than we've had, had in the past. Um, there's lots of issues with, uh, with plug-in hybrids, I, I gotta tell you. This, these, these are technologies that are just now coming into the marketplace. Uh, I think um, we should have gotten started 30 years ago. Um, you know, we, it'll still take a while to get there. The big thing, of course, is batteries. Where's, where's batteries on here? Batteries is, is really the, the, the biggest problem that we have. Um, and, and, and we talk about plug-in hybrids because regular hybrids, and I, I drive a hybrid car, a, a hybrid car allows you to get about 10 to 30 percent savings on your fuel economy. However, if you have a plug-in hybrid and you run on the battery most of the time, you can actually, if you call it, fill up, fill up your car with electricity and, and the amount of fossil fuel you can displace is between 30 and 70 percent. That's really the kind, of, the kind of technology that you want to go to. And by the way, that, that fuel switching to electricity plugging in your car, you're plugging in your car typically at night when, when there's not a big load. Plus, the cost of electricity uh, for driving your car is roughly between, between a half and one-tenth of the cost of, of, of what it would cost you to, to, to run on a, gasoline, a gallon of gasoline. I have plug-in hybrids at our laboratory that we essentially, we, we charge with solar. We charge them with solar panels. And, uh, and the cost that, I, that it costs me to drive those cars is, is one half of what it would cost if I was filling them up with $3 a gallon gasoline. So even with solar that's very expensive, I can do that at half the cost that I can do it with regular fossil fuels. So this is the technology we want to go to. It is about the batteries and we've got to get there sooner or later. Um, lots of technology in terms of materials, roofs, lighting, and superconducting. 
if there's one message I give to the politicians is that we are under-investing in the R&D that's, that will allow us to change the game in which we, in which, in how we um, do our energy economy. There's a lot of technology that can be applied to moving us in another direction than we have in the past. Let me just mention a couple of things about supply because this is kind of what people think about when they think about our laboratory uh, is, is the supply part, not the end use part. But um, the, the, I always get the question, how, you know, we've spent all this money on renewable energy. It, it turns out that over the last 30 years, we've spent less on renewable energy than we have on nuclear. We've spent less on renewable energy than we have on fossil. But never the, nevertheless, what I tell the politicians is, this is what you've gotten for the investment that you've made, something like $7 billion over the course of 30 years. You've gotten these reductions in costs, life cycle costs of these various technologies, in some cases, factor of 10. So there's a lot of technology moving, moving quickly. Um, wind, uh, you keep hearing about wind. Wind is, is, a, uh, uh, is, is the fastest growing technology uh, in, our, in, in our infrastructure today. 35% of all new capacity additions in the electricity sector last year was wind, 35%. 20,000 megawatts, that's 20 gigawatts of, of energy capacity. That turns out to be on, a, on, on an as-produced basis, it's 1.5% of our electricity generation. That's, you know, after you account for the wind doesn't blow all the time and all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of, a lot of potential here. These machines are enormous. They're huge. Uh, there's, there's issues re regarding uh, view sheds and, and uh, you know, these uh, don't, uh, don't look so pretty in, in some cases. Uh, it's interesting... Um, uh, talking to some of the con uh, congressional folks down in Texas, they say, um, you know, um, uh, they may not like them in Massachusetts, but uh, we like them just fine down here in Texas. So uh, I think it's, uh, they've gotten used to looking at their oil derricks and those kinds of things, so these aren't quite as, uh, as uh, much of a problem visually. This is where you see wind being installed in the country. It's installed primarily in the, in the, in the windy places, but there's lots of places where it's not being installed. And it, and, and it could be, and that really has to do with public policy. It's got to do with, with what's driving the technology. I'll show a map later here about the various states and what the various states are doing. It's being driven by, by state regional policies and, and a little bit by federal policies, but not much of that. I show a couple of graphics here because I get a lot of uh, uh, tables, rather. I get a lot of um, questions from utilities, and they say, well, if I put too much wind on my, on my power grid, it's going to cost me extra money. Well, we've done a bunch of studies, and the studies all, and this is just to show you that we've done the studies, if you wanted to, if you wanted to, to include 30%, in, and um, Dick Kelly, who's the CEO of XL Energy up in Minnesota, is on my board, and, and uh, I have the, uh, you know, kind of on pretty good authority, what, what they'll all tell you is that you will spend about a half a cent a kilowatt hour. Okay, half a cent a kilowatt hour. On, on average, you pay somewhere between nine and twelve cents a kilowatt hour on your electric bill. Half a cent a kilowatt hour to put thirty percent wind on your on your grid. Additionally, they say, well, you have to put a bunch of spending reserves. You got to put a lot more reserves if you if you if you put, put wind on there because the more wind you put on there, the more natural gas I have to have in order to make sure that I'm covering the load whenever the wind's not blowing. Well, we've done those studies, and those studies also give you the same kind of numbers. You have 5% reserve uh, margin on, on, a, on a 23 gigawatt grid in, in the Midwest. And if you want to put 25% wind on your grid, you'll need 7%. It's roughly 400 megawatts out of 23,000 megawatts. It can be done. It can be done at a very reasonable price. Um, I'll mention uh, marine energy. Uh, marine energy is kind of a craze now. Um, you know, it's kind of getting, uh, getting um, uh, res uh, resurgence, I guess, of wind, of, of, uh, of, of ocean, rather. And what we find is that uh, it's really embryonic. I'll just, just be honest and say there, we've got 35 to 80 projects in the entire world that are going on right now. A um, lot of potential there. A lot of potential there. This is the amount of energy in, the, in, in wave ocean, uh, ocean wave, rather, ocean current, a river current. Uh, tidal. There's a lot of energy there, but we are just at the beginning stages of doing what I would call any kind of serious um, R&D programs on, on, uh, on, on ocean uh, technology these days. Uh, this thing has laid dormant really for 25, 30 years. We have not done hardly anything. A lot of the Europeans are doing some things on this. I'll mention solar because uh, this is the sunshine state, I think, right? Um, and and, I, and I'm, uh, I'm very bullish on solar. Solar is probably the the, the farthest back in terms of its maturity, 
but the technology that's got the greatest potential. Uh, we, we're, we're now just now getting to the point where we have about a gigawatt of solar on the electric grid in this country. That's a, like a, that first graphic showed this is a minuscule amount of solar. Uh, however, solar technology is very, it's certainly the, the, uh, the, the photovoltaic, the direct conversion of sunlight to electricity, um, is, is probably one of the most elegant technologies that we have, comes out of semiconductor technology, as many of you know. Concentrating solar power is more of the conventional, you know, makes, make uh, hot water or steam or something and run a steam turbine with it. Uh, that technology is coming along as well. Um, lots, of, lots of technology opportunities but where conditions exist, uh, there is, in fact, really nice market niches for these technologies. Cer certainly, standalone power when you don't have access to a grid, all these kinds of things. I'm putting some, some, some uh, fairly uh, significant amount of photovoltaics on my home in, in Colorado, primarily because it's driven by public policy. In Colorado, we have the thing called a renewable portfolio standard. It was voted in by the voters. It's the only state in the union where we did that. And in fact, the utility pays for half of my of my solar installation, and in, I and I will actually pay I will pay back uh, the, the the amount of money that I have out of pocket in three to five years, and then my electricity bills will be constant from that point on. Now that's a pretty good deal for us in Colorado. It, it, if you have to pay the full price of the system, it's not such a good deal. But eventually, that will, the, the prices will come down. The technology is getting better. The, the efficiencies are going, are, are going up it's slowly in some cases. Uh, but the technology that's in the marketplace today is, is the, the most efficient technology is roughly around 20%. In the laboratory, we're demonstrating um, small devices now that are 40%. So I can remember when 20% was the, was the world record. That was literally 30 years ago. Now that's commercial product. And so it'll, there'll come a time, hopefully not 30 years from now, but something sooner, where 40% will be the, um, the, 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 the stuff you see in the marketplace. We started with these little systems that, you know, on your rooftop, and then they got a little bit bigger, and then they became fields, and then they became bigger fields. They put a big system in Europe that was like, you know, 6 megawatts, and then just uh, earlier this year, we put 8.2 megawatts in, uh, in Alamosa, and I think uh, FPL has announced that they're going to put 25 megawatts four times this particular, or three times this particular size unit here in, here in Florida sometime uh, uh, in, the, in the next year or so. So this technology is moving in terms of, in terms of power parks. It's also moving in terms of, of our technology for, for residential. Uh, geothermal, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of opportunity here. We can take advantage of what we know about, about enhanced geothermal drilling from, from the oil and gas industry. We haven't done nearly enough as to what we could do. And, and there's great opportunity there. Uh, I'll say a word about biofuels because it, it tends to be the hot topic. I, I get the chance to brief the Secretary of Energy pretty regularly these days. Uh, you know, he promised the president we were going to get uh, this renewable fuel standard uh, goal. Um, and, and by the way, we've always talked about in, uh, in getting to the, to the, the fuels um, targets that we're looking for, 36 billion gallons in the case of, 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 the, uh, of the new legislation, uh, from non corn ethanol, in other words, from, from non-food related uh, biofuels. That really is really where, where the great opportunity is. Um, we, we've given rise to this, I mean, people ask, what's, what's the cost of these things? The cost today is, is roughly uh, right in here, $2.50. We're probably closer to, to $2 these days. Um, this is, this is the, the, the various components of that cost. Our goal is right here, the 20 and 12 target. I'm quite confident we will reach that 20 and 12 target. And, and this, by the way, is, is about $1.30 a gallon of ethanol. It's equivalent, because there's not as much energy in a gallon of ethanol as there is in a gallon of gas. It's equivalent to $2 a gallon of gasoline. Okay. So by 2012, I am quite confident we will have commercially ready technology at $2 a gallon, not using corn, using the, 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 the waste products of corn stover or, for that matter, wheat straw or, or, um, or um, a variety of other uh, technologies, including woody products and, and, and forests and those kinds of things. This, this next little graphic is, is, is more of a, um, um, of, of a little... Um, um, simulation that we have uh, crafted uh, through our high performance computing. But to demonstrate the complexity in a corn stock, this is this corn, this is what we call corn stover. It's what's left over in the field after you harvest the corn. And, and nature has, has, has engineered this 
uh, essentially biomass. It's, it's a, it's a uh, collection of, of carbon and, and, uh, and hydrogen oxygen atoms in a, in a way in which it is resistant to drought. It's resistant to insects. It allows it to, uh, to be uh, uh, hardy and to hold up the corn, the, the, the corn uh, uh, product and, 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 uh, and uh, fruit. Um, it is a very complex set of, of, uh, of molecules and, uh, and uh, structures. And what we've determined by going in there is, is that the, um, the biomass um, cellulose, which is what, why you call it cellulosic ethanol, the cellulose is, is in the walls of the plant. And, and uh, this gives you a little bit of this fly through, gives you a, an impression of, of, of how, how complicated this is. And as you get down in here, now we're going down into the, really to the, to the small molecules and, and nano uh, structure sort of, sort of um, levels. What you, what you have is these microfibrils that are, that are bundles of these, of these long polymer chains. And that's where the, the molecules are that we're trying to get to. So we do, a, we do an acid pretreat, and then we take these enzymes, enzymes that occur naturally, and they go in and they, and they disassemble these atoms and turn them into sugars. And once they've turned into sugars, then we can ferment them, just like you ferment the corn fruit itself, or sugar cane for that matter. And then at that point, you create um, the opportunity to, to make al alcohol fuels. And for that matter, any kind of fuels that go along with that. Tremendous amount of insight going into this, coming, coming from, the, really from the pharmaceutical industry, believe it or not, not the energy industry. We have not invested in these technologies at all for energy uses. We have invested in, in food products and a variety of other things for, for, uh, for um, uh, other, other applications, but not for these. Ultimately, so it's not really about what this graphic says. It's not just about ethanol. Ethanol happens to be the nearest term thing, but down here is really what we're about, is to take those carbohydrates, which are those long polymer chains that are, that are embedded in everything organic that grows, that, that, we, that we, can, we can harvest, and convert those molecules into hydrocarbons like what we need to fuel our automobiles and our trucks. And that is, in fact, not that far away. We're, we're, we're able to do this kind of with alcohols right now, but we'll eventually be able to do it with the hydrocarbons that look like um, the gasoline and, and products that we use today. And that will make it, of course, then we don't have to change all the infrastructure and all the things that go with that. So it is really about the technology. Uh, I'll say we're just about renewable at, at scale. You really want to do things where you're integrating these renewable distributed resources in with the other uh, products that are going on. I mentioned earlier, it's not just about the technologies. The marketplace will speak. We're going to spend literally trillions of dollars in our marketplace. This piece over here is really important, and it's the policy piece. The policy piece, we need to get that right as we talk about this with all the various politicians and whatnot. It's a blend of all these three things that will allow us to move more quickly to an end state that we're all about. Um, we haven't had what I would call really strong leadership at the federal level for energy policy. We've, we've had lots of bits and pieces. Uh, but we really haven't had it much at the, at, the, at the federal level. I show this graphic because this is really where the action is. I've hosted a number of, of uh, people from the EU and from and other parts of the world. They come to the, they come to the U.S. and they, they hear kind of what's going on in Washington and they really don't have a full appreciation of what's going out where the, where the rubber beats the road out in the, the, uh, the so-called provinces or in the states. There's a lot of activity. The activity that's driven right now is all bottoms up. It's driven by local economic development in, in primarily the states that are colored here. This is where, where there's, there's tremendous activity. These are, the port, these are all the standards for all these 29, 30 states that are out there. And they're not just doing renewable stuff. They're, they're also doing efficiency things. This is the efficiency standards that many of these states have. And they are finding that if they move quickly, they can create economic development regionally and locally. In Colorado right now, we're, we're, we've, just, we've just attracted something on the order of four or 5,000 jobs based on green, green uh, technology, based primarily on, 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 on blade manufacturers and wind technology and solar companies. There is, in fact, a lot of activity. You need three things to really, to really generate local economic development using clean tech. One is you need resources. Typically, many states have resources, all kinds. Second, you need a business climate that's receptive and, and, and actually encourages the kind of investment. And third, you need knowledge workers. You need workers, essentially, universities and others, skilled base on which you can build these, these platforms. So a lot of things that are going on, um, a lot of activity, I think, is important for us to, 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 uh, to, to launch into how can you do 
policy responsibly, you need to think about what your outcomes are and how you're going to get there. So I'll end there. Uh, thank you for your attention. I hope I've uh, given you a little bit of a, of a thought process on what we're about, and hopefully you'll have some questions. Okay, I think uh, um, I'll take some questions, and if you've got some, I'll, uh, I'll answer them. In you have avoided any discussion of nuclear power. Would you cover that, please? Uh, uh, yeah, I would. Um, there, the Department of Energy has three national laboratories that work on applied energy. The Idaho National Laboratory uh, is the, uh, the laboratory whose role and mission it is to look at what I would call sustainable nuclear power technology. Uh, I worked for the University of Chicago for about a year. I, I was got very familiar with that. Um, there is, in fact, uh, I think, a, uh, an opportunity for nuclear to, to have a major contribution into our future energy mix. We've got to solve two problems. First problem is they've got to close the nuclear fuel cycle. We have essentially um, a non-sustainable industry today that is generating more waste than we can possibly deal with on some sort of rational basis. So we need to close the fuel cycle. The Department of Energy is working on those technologies to get there. Second thing they have to do, if you close the nuclear fuel cycle, it typically means fast reactors. It, it typically means breeder reactors or reactors where you're generating fuel that can also be of concern in proliferation of weapons of mass destruction or nuclear materials that you don't want to fall into the wrong people's hands. So you need technologies that are nuclear proliferation resistant as well as closing the nuclear fuel cycle. The Department of Energy's programs are working on, on both of those problems. Um, the national labs have a, a, a position paper into the Secretary of Energy suggesting what we ought to do along those lines. Big research program is what it starts off with, but also very quickly cooperating with, with, our, program, with our partners around the world. So I think it has a role and it has a place. I think the, the technology options in front of it are, are, are very, very high. And that, in fact, uh, uh, it, it, it is not a given that uh, it'll happen anytime soon. And it, we need public policy for uh, encouraging, I think, responsible use of nuclear power, as well as uh, the other things that I've talked about, which my laboratory is responsible for energy efficiency and renewable energy. So I naturally will focus on that. OK. France generates 80% of its energy with nuclear power. Why can't we? Well, uh, there's, a, there's a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, our nuclear power uh, industry is bigger than France's. Uh, we only generate 20%, but we have a much bigger energy consumption than France does. 80% uh, would be four or five times what, what France and we together already um, uh, generate. I don't think there's a single answer that goes all the way to 80%. Um, personally, uh, I do believe that it, it, there's, a, there's an important role. I think we, we, we have a serious problem with aging reactors in this country. We're going to have to replenish the reactors we have today, let alone add to that. So I think we need a concerted effort in that, in that uh, area. Uh, I don't know that we can't get to 80%. Uh, on the other hand, I think there are other options that we have that are much more near-term and much more cost-effective and of lower regrets than, than I think what we have in terms of going fully uh, uh, one technology versus another. Other questions? How hurricane-resistant are those uh, solar panels? <laughs> <laughs> How hurricane resistant are the solar panels? Well, let's see. We have uh, uh, a number of, of tests that we put we put them all through. I, my wife asked me, so how much hail can we stand if we're going to put these panels on our uh, on our roof? Uh, it's it's a it's a valid question. Um, I, I think probably as as uh, resistant as roofs uh, can be. In fact, we have now tile uh, solar panels that can actually just be the the integral part of your roof. So as long as the roof lasts, uh, then, then the solar panel will last. Uh, they are all guaranteed 25 years. So you have warranties for 25 years on all these technologies uh, today. Uh, that's what I have on, on mine. And uh, that's what I would expect would be a consumer requirement. So uh, without answering your question specifically, I think if it's a Category 5, it's probably uh, not very. Uh, <laughs> but um, if it's something less than that, hopefully it's, it'll, it'll last like the roof lasts. Um, yes, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm not paying attention to who's first or second. So just thank you, sir. Um, regarding the wind technology, mm -hmm. 
The power obviously is generated totally by the wind. The wind can be fickle. Uh, when you put in uh, a study for wind driving the propeller blades, is there a, a study that considers that there may be a drop in wind at certain times of the year, uh, which won't propel enough power energy to cover the uh, energy that's normally required? There could be a drop off or a, you know, an un un estimated time when the wind is down and there's no energy being produced. Mm -hmm. how, how do you work that study out if there's going to be energy from a, a fickle source? Um, okay, well, uh, so the, the first answer to your question is we're running the, the uh, essentially the, I won't call it the experiment, but we're running a set of, of, um, of uh, outcomes right now on utility grids. So Excel, who is my utility, uh, has roughly 2,400, 2,400 megawatts of wind energy on the Colorado grid. Um, they are um, uh, managing that uh, by the way the utilities work is they forecast a day ahead. And, and part of the difficulty that they have, and, and this is what they'll tell you, uh, is that they can't forecast very accurately how much wind they're going to have tomorrow at this time. Uh, they can get close. They can get plus or minus. Well, close is not, cl my close is not their close. The, the, my close is plus or minus 25%. That's where they are today. What they tell me is they need to get to plus or minus 5%. And we are actually working on uh, climate modeling and a variety of things that relate to how can we forecast day ahead in the microclimate. Because every, every, every uh, percent of, in, in Excel's case, every percent of improvement in the uncertainty is a million dollars to their bottom line. So they are really motivated to get that well, to get that right. Now, it turns out that they have roughly 8% of their grid is, is wind. At night, when the wind's blowing and they don't have much load, they are up around 30 to 35 percent of their entire capacity is being supplied by wind. So they have to do some things differently than they originally contemplated. Now, in Colorado, we, we've got an RPS that says 20 percent wind by, by the year 2020, um, or 20 percent renewables, which is going to be mostly wind by the year 2020. Uh, they're beginning to manage that. If you go to Denmark, they are at 45 percent wind today, year-round. Um, it can be managed. It, ha it has to be done in a, in a thoughtful manner, and it, and it is, in fact, got, it's got bottom-line implications. And so you have to consider that. That's where those costs come in. And, and so it's not business as usual. You just can't slap the things in there and hope that they're going to work. You actually have to manage it. So we're running those you know, real-life experiences now and we're learning from those experiences, and we'll get better at this. I'm confident we can get to 20, 25 percent, you know, from wind without really compromising the electricity grid. Uh, yes, you're right behind. Talking about uh, wind energy, I've heard problems related to noise, which is an environmental issue, as well as uh, the sight the visual, which is an environmental issue. Uh, these, we've, we've got also got environmental issues with regard to offshore uh, exploring mm -hmm. because of the beaches and the environmental issues of site and so forth. What's your attitude or opinion in, in, in that regard? For wind, yeah, I, I think your your uh, your um, the, the issues are real issues, real issues of, of of aesthetics, the issues of of um, uh, whether or not they're putting the migratory path of birds and 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 also noise. I think are all real issues. I think we, those need to be uh, approached responsibly, like with any technology. And I don't really it doesn't matter what you know you you name the technology, fossil fuel, gas, whatever. If you don't look at all of those environmental impacts, if you don't look at land use, air use, water use, um, the things that really relate to how sustainable is our future energy economy, then I think you'll sub-optimize. Uh, wind is not the answer for every location. Solar is not the answer for every location. Every location needs to have its own set of answers. What I tell the politicians in terms of public policy is I say, look, 
why don't you define what it is specifically that you want out of your future energy mix? It's got to be secure, and it's got to be safe, it's got to be affordable, it's got to have environmental, you know, less environmental impact. It's got to have low water usage. I mean, the water usage in our fossil fuel industry today is horrendous. We can't continue to do that. And, and yet, it's never considered. We, get, we ask the questions about the renewable technology, we never ask the questions about the existing technologies. So address all of those attributes and variables and say, this is what we want out of a sustainable future energy economy, and then be totally technology agnostic and say, come one, come all. Let's do whatever it takes to get us to those attributes, and let's pay whatever it takes to get us to those, to those outcomes. And that's how we should approach our policy, not technology by technology. I don't think it's a race between technologies. I think it's a race for sustainability, and I think that sustainability needs to be defined, and then we get to that outcome via market forces working you know, the way market forces work. I mean, the, the, the government's not going to do this. The private sector is going to do this. And we just got to give them the opportunity to do it so that we get the outcomes that we're looking for. Uh, My question has to do with photovoltaics for an individual level. You have a lot of um, the mass generation of electricity. What about um, small homes? have in, in, in which you would not have the in infrastructure problem of um, the large transmission lines and making it more affordable. How is the research going in, in that direction? Well, I, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because I think it's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of what I think is the value of, of distributed technologies. Uh, we built, uh, we helped build, we helped design. In fact, we designed and, and Habitat for Humanity built a home in the Denver area, Wheat Ridge, um, in which we adhered to the, the criteria that Habitat for Humanity puts in, in place for the homes that, that they build for these needy families. And, and we, we, so we didn't break, you know, we didn't break the cost uh, boundaries, and we built a, we built a small home uh, that had essentially a really, really tight uh, uh, envelope so that it was very, very efficient. And it uses literally 30% of the energy that a normal home uses. And then we put some photovoltaic panels on, on the roof of it, uh, two kilowatts to be exact, uh, and we've monitored that home for the last two years. And I can tell you that home right now generates 25% more energy on an annual basis than it uses. That's a Habitat for Humanity home built to their standards. It can be done at a very, very small level. And I think, you know, for those of us that like the idea of getting off the grid, so to speak, you know, uh, that's, a, that's a, you know, it, it's, it's doable. Now, every location is different. It needs to, you need to tailor it around the conditions. You know, that, that's a cold weather home. So you might have a different set of conditions for a, for a, for a home that's perhaps um, in, a, in a warmer, more humid climate. But uh, those, the point is the existence proofs are being done today. And I think it is a matter, in fact, Habitat is, is very, very pleased with what they're doing, and they've incorporated many of those design features into what we're doing uh, going forward. We have time for just a couple more questions. Um, okay, I, and I'm sorry. I, I, let me see. This gentleman over here. Uh, <laughs> yes, thank you. I was wondering if your laboratory was doing any research on water as a renewable fuel source, like the water fuel cells. Uh, you know, we do we do a lot. Primarily, we try to avoid using water. I mean, obviously, what we're trying to do is is, is uh, water efficiency is really important. We we have a number of what I would call revolutionary. Uh, technologies that we're pursuing, some of which are direct conversion of solar to fuels, using water splitting as, a, as, a, as an intermediate uh, without going through electrolysis to, to do some things by st skipping some steps. Uh, the, all the stuff that relates to, to, to nanotechnologies, uh, the, the, the laws of physics change at the very, very small level, uh, small uh, uh, sizes and dimensions. And as a result, we're trying to harness some of those new things. So uh, without specifically uh, talking about water, because we don't have what I would call any kind of really robust um, uh, technologies that really relate to water so much, but we do have direct conversion of you know, solar to fuels and solar to, to electricity and photo conversion and a variety of things that I think are, are going to be game changers going forward. Uh, uh, it was really interesting. I had uh, the opportunity to, to host uh, Larry Page a couple of, of uh, weeks ago. Larry Page is the founder of Google. Many of you know that. And uh, his, his interest was, I want, like he says, I want the 10 smartest people in the whole world, and let's just go solve this problem and go do gigawatts and a dollar watt. You know, I guess you can do that if you're a billionaire. And, and um, 
what I told him, I said, you know, I, I really, you're, you're inspiring to, to those of us that came to this laboratory 30 years ago because we came to do that kind of stuff. We've not been allowed to do that. But for the, the, the vision and the resources to make that happen, I, you know, I'm confident that the, that the technologies and the innovation, innovation and creativity will be there. So, so I appreciate the question because I think what it speaks to is that revolutionary, game-changing kind of, kind of opportunities that go with it. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, here. You're, you're inspiring to us. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> and, of course, everybody wants to know what they can do to help. Uh, my real question, though, is uh, considering the fact that you discussed the waste products of uh, nuclear, and uh, then I, I thought about the maintenance required for all of the other renewable energies and, like, and the solar, the... Uh, wind generators and everything else. There must be something in the cost, on the life cycle cost added for maintenance and disposal of the uh, deteriorated or used up uh, materials. So you want to address that? Well, I, we do. What I'd like to, 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 to fall back on is the fact that when we start looking at new technologies, especially those that are going to be disruptive technologies, I think we need to do that. Last slide, I didn't do it justice to spend time on it. But I think we need to do a full-up life cycle analysis. We, we've not really done that in, in many respects on, across many of the technologies. But what, what, are, what are those um, perhaps hidden or otherwise unknown kinds of implications of using these technologies when, in fact, you do scale them on a global level. What does that mean in terms of both uh, water use, land use, uh, you know, value, uh, value chain? Uh, what, other, what other byproducts do they disrupt or otherwise change behavior that give you unintended consequences regarding the outcomes that you're looking for? And I think we haven't really done that. We, we've really not analyzed our energy system as a system. We need to think about it holistically. We need to think about it in the context of global usage. And, you know, m much of what we talk about today is, is, is showing U.S. leadership. The fact of the matter is, if we don't lead, the rest of the world is going to overwhelm anything we do. And it's really, it's China, India, Indonesia uh, will, will have, in fact, China's already passed us in terms of carbon emissions. They will soon pass us in terms of every other metric there is. They're growing as dirty as we grew without, without any, there's no, there's, there's no restriction. We need to be thinking about, again, analyze that in a, on a holistic basis, not just domestically but globally, and then how is it that we can help lead them to, know, to, to, to make wiser choices regarding our energy future I mean, China's building a, a coal-fired power plant every five days. And they're, and they're not building the clean stuff. They're building the dirty stuff. And, and that's going to be there for 50 to 100 years. Now, if we can't export technology that is much more friendly to the environment, and for that matter, friendly to, to the economy, then we really have missed the opportunity that I think is really in front of us because they're growing really rapidly. So it's really about leadership. You know, and I, again, I'm back to, back to informing our, our, our uh, politicians. The U.S. needs to take a leadership role. We're the best at innovation and creativity. We can do that, and it can be in our self-interest as well as in their interest to do so. This, is, this shouldn't be a trade-off. This should be something that we do cooperatively and collaboratively. Because if we don't do it, you know, other countries, are, they're not going to wait for us. They're, just, they're, they're headed out, and they're moving very rapidly. So this, I think, is an opportunity for us to regain leadership if we act now. If we don't act, uh, I think uh, we will uh, be destined to whatever outcome uh, others uh, provide to us. So we'll take one more question, and then I think maybe... Uh, uh, you keep talking about the good technology and how this should be moving on. It also seems to be that there's something that's stopping it. Uh, what really is slowing this down? Is that the economics of the process, or is the politicians who are saying we want it, but they're not allowing it to happen? Well, now you're going to get me into a political conversation. <laughs> and I probably will get in big trouble for this. But, um, you know, I, I've, I've tried to, I mean, I've been at this for 30 years, so I'm trying to figure out, so, so why, why are we talking today about the same stuff we were talking about 30 years ago? And, and, and a lot of it has to do with the fact we, we don't really have a very informed public. I, I think the consumers are a big part of what's going to happen 
to, I mean, we all elect our elective officials, and our elected officials act pretty much as though as 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 rep, our representatives, in and in for the most part, representing what they believe our interests are. Um, I, I think um, we really haven't had an honest dialogue around what the future energy mix ought to look like. And I don't think, I mean, it's, you know, it's kind of one of these things where when the price of oil is high, everybody's interested in energy, and when the price of oil is low, we're not. It's just that simple. I've got graphics to show that, the, you, you know, when the price of oil is high, we get a lot of funding, and when the price of oil is low, we get low funding. It's, it is, in fact, one of those, one of those very, very difficult um, um, political questions that have, it has a lot to do with public perception. And, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that, you know, we, I mean, today our homes are twice as big as they were 20 years ago. You know, um, our, our cars are no more efficient than they were 20 plus years ago. Um, we haven't valued the things that we say we value. And we haven't been able to put a price on them. And our, on our behavior is commensurate with kind of what our values are. So until we have an honest dialogue, I don't think we'll see a lot of change. That's why, you know, there's got to be some, kind of some radical movement. God forbid that there's, a, there's some sort of, uh, you know, uh, calamity or, 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 or a huge crisis that we have to respond to. But unfortunately, that's kind of how this country works. We work when there's a huge crisis. And somehow we've got to get a crisis mentality without actually having to go through the crisis to get there. And, I, and that's the hard part. I think, you know, you, you're probably, <laughs> probably wiser about that than I am, but it's frustrating because that's the part that we don't have. You know, it's not, you know, and I'll now say something really political. It's not really about taking any oil out of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, and it's not really about taking a gas tax holiday on our gasoline. I mean, those two things are, are both, you know, campaigns have, have advocated those things. Those two things distract us from the real issue that's in front of us. Those are kind of, I'm going to help you right now, and you don't have to do anything. Uh, we, we all have to do something. And it's not just about, you know, put a sweater on, turn the thermostat down. It's not about that. There, I think there is plenty of opportunity here to use this as a tool of economic development and to do so in a way that's responsible as well as fuels the future and allows us to do the, what we do best, which is, which is creativity, innovation, and business value creation. I think we can do all those things. But we need a different dialogue, a different discourse, and it can't be so partisan. It has got to be done on a bipartisan basis. And that's the hard part that, that I think uh, as, as citizens, we've got to demand that. Say, so, you know, it's not about one side or the other side. It's about we've got to do this together. And, and uh, that sounds kind of corny, but, it, but in fact, I think that's really where, where, where we're missing a big part of this. Hopefully after the election's over, uh, you know, we'll get back to, to, to th thinking about it in that way. Thank you all for your attention. election are, are um, uh, talking about renewable energy in, in particular, but clean energy and, and a new energy economy of the future. Um, so I'm going to kind of run the, through my uh, slides very, very quickly, um, uh, hopefully to get uh, uh, some, some uh, uh, stimulation of maybe some questions that, that, that are really on your mind. I'm anxious to hear kind of how you um, view this topic. Uh, and, and I get a lot from your questions whenever I get a chance to talk to you about these things. So I'm going to go rather quickly. I'm going to say some things that many of you already know, and for hopefully uh, you'll, some new things that will come, uh, be insights that will be of value to you as well. Uh, our challenges are enormous. I said that earlier. Uh, is it about security? Is it about economic productivity? Or is it about environment? Well, the fact is it's about all three, and we need to do those um, quite uh, aggressively. Uh, there's mounting evidence. We all uh, understand uh, how um, our, our, our climate is changing in, in many respects. Uh, I think the uh, uh, International Panel on, uh, on uh, Climate Change would, would suggest that that is in human-induced. And there's lots of issues that relate to um, the effect uh, that global warming is having. Probably the thing that, that gets to most uh, Americans is the price of, uh, of gasoline. When you go to the pump and you all of a sudden see the price going through the roof, uh, it really becomes to, it starts to hit home. And this is really where the dialogue has begun. Uh, in recent years, it's really about technology, um, or I'm sorry, rather about energy security than it is about anything else. Uh, and so um, let's examine that for a moment, and then I'll come back to what renewable energy is and, the, and, the, and their value and the role of R&D that goes along with that. This is uh, the Energy Information Administration. It's, a, it's the agency that's been embedded in, within the Department of Energy that gives us projections about where our energy mix is today and where we will be uh, decades from now. 
Um, it's, uh, this is our mix today. You can see it's primarily fossil fuel, and it will remain that way for some time. Uh, interesting enough, people will, will, will uh, kind of be surprised by the fact that we've got 6% renewables today, and the projections are, even though the amount of energy uh, required for the country is going to increase by 34%, is that so we, our, our policymakers look at these graphics and they say, well, gosh, if you were down here on this one, it's only 5% by the year 2040. You know, the kind of the, the, the conclusion one draws is why bother? Um, you know, some of these others are a little bit more. Uh, what, what, are the, what are the assumptions that are behind this? Well, they're over here in the legend. And the legend is that even under the most um, extreme conditions, we think that the price of a barrel of oil may get to $100 a barrel. So, obviously, uh, there's, uh, there's a problem with, with the assumptions. And, and it's very clear that, um, that uh, what we don't know is we, we, we really have a hard time uh, projecting where things are going to be. And, and I think what you'll find is that many of these folks, these are, these are done by economists. They're done by um, econometric models, we call them. And they're a little bit like driving your car and projecting where you're going by looking in the rearview mirror. It's, by, it's, it's, it's what, what has happened in the past, and if you just extrapolate what has happened in the past to the future, that's the projection you're going to get. That's kind of the way the models are, are geared, and that's essentially what you get. But it does not accommodate fully the, 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 the market dislocations that occur when there are disruptions in oil and those kinds of things. It does not um, take into account, uh, obviously, uh, the, you know, the volatility of the price of oil and, and, and uh, innovation, innovation in the R&D community. So that is where I think there is great opportunity. And it really uh, then helps me answer the question that, um, that I get from, uh, from the Congress, which is how much can we aspire to in terms of renewable energy and energy efficiency? And I take that question and I turn it around and I ask it back to the member of Congress and I say, how much would you like? Because it is not a matter of technical potential. It is a matter of investment and commitment to make these outcomes that you want to have happen. Um, the good news is um, I had a chance to host the president uh, a couple of years ago back at the laboratory. And he came and we had a, a nice discussion around a variety of topics. But what was interesting to me was that there was no lack of will for suggesting that there can be a large fraction of our energy mix in the future from renewable energy. And it is a, ma a, mat a matter of of investment and technical will. So in the, in the national program that we only get to 10%, and I can tell you that two years ago, this same projection was that that number would be 7%. So the good news is that it, they're at least acknowledging that renewables will be more than it is, um, uh, you know, la more than it will, well, it will be more than, than we thought it would be last year, but uh, I will offer that it's, um, it's still quite a bit less than what I think it will actually be. Uh, now, if you just look at the electricity part, and you ask, uh, where do we get our power generation from? And this is, this is the map that, that gives you that. So it's primarily half coal, um, natural gas, nuclear is about 20%. Uh, hydropower is about 7%. So all the total renewables is about 9.5%. This non-hydro renewables is 2.4%. And of the 2.4%, most of that, believe it or not, is biomass. People wouldn't expect that, but it's biomass power pulp and paper kinds of, kinds of uh, industries that use a lot of it. And, and here's wind. Wind is 27%. I'll talk more about that later. Geothermal is 15%. Solar is one half of 1%. And, and that is of the two point, that one half of 1% of this piece, which is only 2.4%, which is a little bitty minuscule piece. And I just wanted to, to, to reiterate that. Well, so I've been in this business a long time, as I mentioned, and the first question that I always get asked, and I, I got a chance to testify in front of Congress last year five different times, I got the same questions both times. Um, first question was, when is this stuff going to be real? And the second question is, and, and how much can we actually get? So the first question uh, I will answer here in a moment, you know, I, 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 uh, uh, I, I told the, the, the members of Congress, it's real today. It's just not real in the U.S. It's real to the tune of $150 billion a year in terms of an industry, but it's not much in the U.S. Um, and how much can we get is really answered by this particular graphic. This graphic is a projection. Uh, again, EIA is the Energy Information Agency. IEA is the International Energy Agency. This is out of, out of Paris. And then the, the Pew is the Pew Foundation. All of these various uh, groups that project what the, what, the, um, what, the, what the potential can be, really uh, have a bunch of assumptions embedded in what they, what they assume. And what was interesting to me...
Thanks, Ken, and, and I uh, just want to uh, thank you for uh, both uh, warm welcome reception. Uh, Ken asked me to come here uh, literally about a year ago, and uh, due to schedule conflicts and a number of other things, it's been um, hard uh, finding the time to, uh, to put all this together, but I'm really glad this has finally happened, and I'm glad to hear, be here with all of you. Um, I get a chance to talk about renewable energy now. Gosh, I feel like I'm on the lecture circuit almost every week. Um, and I start almost every talk with, uh, it's a great time to be in the renewable energy business. It, it hasn't always been that way. I've been uh, in this um, particular topical area pretty much my entire professional career. That's uh, well over 30 years these days. Uh, I, I left Bell Labs when I was um, a young, young engineer to start the solar programs down at Sandia National Laboratories in Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, before uh, SARI and now NREL ever existed, before DOE existed. It was back in the, in the ERDA uh, era. And uh, so it's really quite refreshing to see uh, how much uh, things have changed, how, in fact, um, all that work that's been going on for literally three decades is finally coming to fruition. Um, and I'll start with kind of the good news story, because I think uh, the other part that I would like for you to take away uh, this evening is that um, the challenge that we have in front of us in terms of, um, in terms of our energy um, uh, challenges for the country and for that matter for the world are, uh, are horrendous. They're, they're, they're daunting, they're uh, incredibly acute and I don't think uh, the national dialogue really um, fully appreciates that. Uh, I think it's refreshing that we're having a national dialogue. I, I, I'm, I'm pleased that uh, uh, both campaigns and the president today, here is what you see in terms of our aspirations, and I'll call these aspirational goals, not because we can't get there, but because it takes a lot of things in order for us to get there, and I'll, and I'll mention that here in a minute. Um, a couple of uh, months ago, we unveiled a thing called the 20% Electricity Vision. Um, this is a report that we, uh, we um, uh, co-authored uh, at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory with the Department of Energy and, and 50 other groups, and essentially we, we develop the roadmap by which you get to 20% of our electricity from wind technology by the year 2030. Now this just happens to be the report that if you're watching any of the news programs these days, you'll see T. Boone Pickens up talking about renewable energy and talking about wind. He holds this report up and says, we, and now he wants to do this in 10 years, which I find really aggressive, but uh, you know, uh, T. Boone has a lot, of, uh, a lot of experience in the marketplace. I mean, I, I, I certainly do value what, uh, how, he, how he approaches things. Um, I will also add that there's a 10% electricity goal by the year 2025, uh, but from solar, and there's also a, um, a renewable fuels, in this case it happens to be uh, biofuels and, and, and ethanol in particular, uh, 36 billion gallons by the year 2022. That's all part of the Energy Security Act. Now, what I tell the members of Congress, and I had literally uh, 20 members of Congress come through the laboratory last week, uh, was the following. If we were to achieve each one of these goals, it would cost us, literally, down here, down, down here, $2 trillion of investment over the course of the next two decades. Now, the interesting thing is that if you look at what EIA projects, EIA projects that there will be, in fact, $2 trillion investment in infrastructure in this country for energy over the next two decades. Internationally, it'll be $22 trillion. It is a lot of money. A lot of money will be spent in our energy infrastructure over the course of the next two decades. The question is, what will we spend that money on? Will we spend it on the conventional approach to, th to, our, to our energy mix, or will we do something different than what we've done in the past? And that really is a policy question, and one that I think uh, is, deserves a lot of dialogue and discussion in